Have you settled the score about the drop chain? No. <laughs> it's written down. It's Baden Cook. I completely forgot about Baden Cook. He forgot about it. The thing is, Mr. Surprise, that I won. It's not many occasions where you actually set a plan and they actually come off. Hearing that from him, you know, gives me gives me goosebumps. Cadell Evans cannot be beaten now. This is the first time I hear Stewie and Andy side of the story. And I took a cab home in the Magna Rosa, and the cab driver did not believe me. That that was actually the pink jersey. Why the hell would you be in my cab? What I've learned through my life is everything is just a phase, you know? It's a real pleasure for me to be able to come back and, uh, and, and jump on here with you guys, because um, I admire what you do. I really do. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in for another edition of the Detour Podcast. Normally we say the Detour Live, but we're not live today, Iffy, and the anxiety levels have plummeted. Oh, well, I was never anxious about it. I caused all the problems, <laughs> but I'm never, I was never anxious about it. <laughs> oh, mate. Just every time we went live, okay, we loved the interaction live with, you know, people tuning in and putting in comments and that, but just in the modern world of tech issues, you know, it's great having the ability to chop stuff out. And we've got a <laughs> bunch of interviews coming up. Uh, we obviously speak to, you know, Grace Brown, uh, Luke Plapp, Tim Decker, and uh, Liz Heppel. So there's there's a fair bit of content to get through. But particularly with Grace, she had a few internet issues. So we were able to yeah. chop out all the dead spots, mate. So we dodged so a did Plappy, So we dodged a couple of bullets because Plappy had the same. So anyway, all good. But uh, before we get into our first chat that uh, we did with Grace Brown, it's obviously been a, a pretty big couple of weeks since we were last on the pod. Um, the Tour de France fam has wrapped up, and what an epic finale to that race, mate. Oh, wow. It's as good a stage as I've seen in a, in a Tour de France, men or women. And uh, it, it turned out being the closest of all time, we got even past the was it 89 or whatever when... Uh, uh, or 87 when, uh, um, yeah, Le Mans won by eight seconds. Well, now four seconds. And it was only 10 seconds back to third place overall. I mean, it was a staggering stage. Staggering. Yeah, and great to see him racing up Alpe d'Huez, which is obviously an iconic climb uh, in the men's event. But uh, you'd think that, particularly in France, after the Olympics, I mean, they just love sport and great crowds uh, for Fantastic the Tour de France crowd. frame as well. Yeah, sensational. I mean, the, the crowds in the, at the beginning of the tour in Rotterdam were as big as any crowds have been in the men's Tour de France. So it really has is coming of age. And already the, the, the stories are coming through that's going to be increased more days again So uh, mm. for, for next year, which, which is as it should be. And it's it becoming so much uh, more professional, the, the quality of the – Racing is what's really standing out to me. You know, they're going, they're going really hard over mountains and there's a large groups to there. That wasn't the case just a couple of years ago. So, you know, it really is stepping up. Fantastic. As we said, we're going to touch on that. You're going to wrap things up with uh, Liz Heppel at the end of the show, but we're going to kick things off with an interview with Australia's first gold medalist from the Paris 2024 Olympics, uh, Grace Brown. She's been on the show a few times, but... We thought we'd check in with her and, and see how life's changed since since she won gold. All right, huge guest, Johnny. Huge guest. One of the biggest. Yeah, big happened. drum roll, Never. big drum roll, because here we are, Grace Brown, Olympic gold medalist. How's that sound? Uh, it sounds pretty good. Still getting used to it, to be honest. But uh, yeah, happy with that one. <laughs> Is that the most common intro you've had on any media you've done since you won the gold? Like Olympic gold medalist, how does that – is it processed yet? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's the, it's the general intro, so um, – but still haven't got used to it. <laughs> it- I've got to say, I, I, we're lucky enough to be mates with you and we talk to you regularly and you come to our mayo's on lunches and all of that. But And in the weeks leading up, every time I messaged you or spoke with you, you sounded so confident. I mean, I know – it was frustratingly last two world titles to lose by just such a handful of seconds. You were determined that that wasn't going to happen here. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know. I just I felt like I'd had a really good preparation and um, everything was going well. Uh, and really that's all you can ask for heading into a big goal like that because 
there's usually some sort of um, bad luck that trips you up. So, yeah, I knew that I was in, in shape to do it, but still there's little doubts that creep in despite the general confidence. How, how did you go on the day, Grace? Like, obviously the weather was a big talking point and, you know, it, it claimed victim to a lot of riders in those tricky conditions. But how did you approach that when you saw, okay, it's, it's going to be a wet one? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone was hoping that maybe the rain would clear or not come or something, but we knew a couple of days out that it was going to be wet. So I uh, just chose to accept that. And the main thing, I was just annoyed that, like, I'd practiced all these corners at full speed and I knew that I was going to have to <laughs> to revise that um, and go a bit slower. And when you're just trying to go full steam, like, sitting up early for a corner, washing off speed. It's just really frustrating. But, um, yeah, I just I just uh, planned my corn, – replanned my corners and um, was quite comfortable with the speed that I had to do through with them and maybe got a bit lucky. Luck was nothing to do with it. But I was very impressed because I read stories afterwards where people were trying to give you information about where people were crashing and all of that. And you said, no, I don't want that. I, d I just let me ride my race. You didn't want to get all the negative uh, build up. Is that the case? Well, yeah, I didn't actually. I, I saw one image before I started of a competitor crashing. Um, and other than that, I didn't realise that so many other competitors were coming down on the course and we didn't really discuss it um, but yeah Dean Bates who was on the radio behind me um, wisely chose not to tell me about it because you know when when you know that lots of competitors are coming down then you get a little tense and then and don't take the corners as well yourself so um, yeah better to be in ignorance about that one, I think. In Australia, of course, it was enormous because it was the first gold medal of any uh, for any sport for for the Aussies, uh, and that you know w w was amazing. But what's it been like with the, with the uh, since that's happened with all of the the, the news from home? And I, I mean, I'm sure you've been in demand for for the media. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a bit of a whirlwind since uh, since the race just. Lots of attention, um, lots of media and, um, yeah, it's just been really nice. Everyone's supporting from Australia, um, just feeling, feeling a lot of love from everyone. So just uh, soaking all that up while it's there because I know that it doesn't last forever. <laughs> <laughs> and another good story was obviously from Camperdown. It's not a big town at all, you know, a rural country town in Victoria. And obviously Penny Smith the shooter who, who got bronze, I mean, surely there's got to be plans for one of the biggest celebrations in the history of Camperdown. Yeah, Camperdown uh, has definitely pushed above its uh, weight this Olympics and, um, yeah, the whole town's really stoked both um, with my medal and uh, with Penny Smith. And so there's a clock tower in the centre of town um, and, yeah, they've, decorated they've got lights on it at night in green and gold to uh celebrate our olympics <laughs> so um really cool for the small town of camperdown grace it, it's the dream of a lot of children just to compete in the olympics just to represent your country but you know a lot of them say well one day i'd love to win a gold medal but I, what i'm fascinated is what was that feeling like when you're on the hot seat you know you're the first rider to ride under 40 minutes but when that realization, oh my God, this has actually happened, um, what what is that feeling like for for a young person watching this and hoping for one day that that comes true? Yeah, it's um, sort of hard to describe. I think um, I've sort of had the realization in the last couple of kilometers of my race that um, yeah, that I probably had won the race and um, at that point it was just excitement because you know it was still still in the moment it hadn't quite been realized and then um, yeah once I only had Chloe Diger behind me so once she crossed the line and it was clear that I was um, the fastest time it was just 
I don't know. It's it's sort of hard to describe because it's something that you like chase after for so long and then it comes and it's just a bit um, unreal. But but what makes it real, I think, is when, once you get to share it with um, all the people that have been on the journey with you. So, yeah, I've had my husband Elliot there and my parents made it into the grandstands, my coach and... Um, yeah, the the Oz Cycling crew as well, just everyone that had been on the journey with me and the excitement and the, you know, raw emotion of it all, that's what makes it real. Um, and super special, yeah. I loved it when they uh, interviewed your mum and dad on the side of the road while the race was going on and uh, it was just fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I think they I think they were more excited than me. <laughs> Almost they were just um I yeah, they get really wrapped up in my racing. So um oh, it, was, it was really awesome and yeah, brought tears to my eyes watching the replay of that one. And is the most common response when you put the medal around your family and your friends neck, like, Jeez, it's heavy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's so heavy. Like unexpectedly so, like I don't know, you've you think that it'll be like weighty, but really it's a heavy metal. Um, and yeah, you feel it pulled down on your neck. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. It's got part of the Eiffel Tower in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you can answer a question we've been debating, Dan, and I want to know what's in the box that they give you at the medal ceremony? Oh, it's. Um, it's just like a little poster. Uh, uh, yeah, there's. It's a poster of Paris, really, like a, a cup illustration. So, a um, bit random. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the pool room. They could have wrapped Straight it up and room. made it look a little bit nicer than <laughs> than the cardboard box. <laughs> Re- really We're, appreciate your time, Grace, and really good, Dal. Good, to the France friend. All right. See you now. Bye. Yeah, see you guys. Fantastic stuff there from Grace. Uh, didn't have the Tour de France femme that she would have hoped for, Ify. Obviously, a bit of bad luck um, throughout the race. Yeah, well, she was going in there, uh, you know, with mainly a domestic role, but she really wanted to to do a good time trial, but she punched in slow wheel change. So that was, that was the end of that. But uh, very strong in the last few days. <laughs> She's a powerful, powerful bike rider. But uh, no change on the uh, uh, retiring bit. She's, uh, no matter what people are trying to say to her, no, she's, she knows her time is done. She's happy. And uh, what a season. I mean, Paris, not only win a gold medal in Paris, but to uh, win Liège, best on Liège, one of the big classics, a mm. monument. Uh, it's just an amazing season. Yeah, it's been phenomenal. And another phenomenal story uh, is Tim Decker and in particular the the team's pursuit, uh, what they managed to achieve uh, at the Olympics this year. Because going into it, they weren't they weren't the favourites. I mean, everyone was talking about particularly the Italians and Ghana. And, you know, you saw what happened when the Aussies hit the track and, and blitzed them straight off the gun. I mean, the Italians looked rattled. But uh, Tim Decker is obviously a big part of the success of that. And it's a shame that they don't give medals to the coaches, Ify. I reckon they should. I reckon they should as well because they're very, very much part of it. We would have had a couple of uh, uh, extra Aussies getting gold medals because uh, Gary Sutton was the coach of the of the women uh, test pursuit, uh, an Aussie uh, with the Americans. <laughs> Wrong country, but anyway. Um, I think he's heading back to Australia next year. I wonder what, uh, if you Take a roll back with Australian cycling. We'll see. We'll see. Mm. Well, here's the interview with uh, Tim Decker, who's the head endurance coach for the track program. Okay. Dear, dear to our fans, we said we have one superstar. Well, we've got another superstar. Timmy Decker, uh, great Australian cycling coach, just back from uh, the Paris uh, Olympics. Timmy, firstly, welcome back to Oz. Great to be back. Uh, yeah, it's been a been a long time uh, overseas. I think I calculated this year I've spent 105 days away from the family overseas out of 227 so far. So good to be home. Now, 
Congratulations, mate. I mean, uh, no one was picking you to win the gold medal here. We, uh, the, the general consensus, well, they might get up for another bronze. Cause, uh, but uh, you certainly I changed all of that. No, oh, well, I should have spoken <laughs> to you and not the other clowns that are around the place. But uh, you should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> welcome uh, and, and congratulations. I mean, um, take us through it. I mean, to break the world record, that was just staggering. Did you expect that? Uh, I, I'd always thought that, um, it would be possible to get close to the world record again. Um, cause, cause you've got to be prepared in an, in an Olympic games to, uh, to be around that mark if you want to be challenging for, for gold medals. Um, and look, we just, that, that night the, that they broke the world record, the boys were really on. Um, we, we had a plan around making sure that we were, uh, well ahead before Ganna, uh, took over in his last turn because Ganna is such a phenomenal athlete. Um, you just, you can't give him, if you give him half a second to run you down, uh, you know, he'll find a way he's, he's such a champion, but uh, I mean, having said that, we, we also have a, a champion in Sam Wilson and, and you know, this Olympics, he got to show what his his real character is. Um, you know, the last Olympics, there was a, with the misfortune, he didn't get to ride fourth wheel, but um, having a smooth run into this Olympics and allowing him to go in that fourth wheel position and really finish strong, um, Sam got to show what his capabilities were as well. And uh, so, so we didn't want, we didn't want Ghana to be uh, close to us, um, even though I think Sam uh, matched him. Um, so we got up and got up early and yeah, it was uh, phenomenal. Now you touched on uh, the little thing of before. So let's go back to Tokyo with that uh, disaster of the, of the, of the broken head stem and uh, young Alec Porter going down. Uh, in a screaming heap. To come back, from, I mean, brilliant that we ended up getting the bronze medal. I say we because we're you know, it's us. Well, we're, we're all we're all Aussie, aren't we? We're all Australian. <laughs> we're all in. But it. but you know, uh, uh, probably you know, a bit fortunate in some ways with it with with the with the, the palms. But um, t- so from there, you know, you, you left after that. What brought you back? Uh, the knowledge that, um, that, that there was unfinished business and, uh, that I knew that these guys had the capability of, uh, winning the Olympics. Um, and, and that really drew me back and I I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want to let Australia down. And, um, you know, I, I always believed that we could win and um, to actually make it happen is um, is the next big step. Like it's easy to say things, it's very hard to, to do them or back them up. But um, in this case, it managed to come together uh, really well. So Now before we get into the actual Olympics and you can take us through the, 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 the big ride, um, just how hard is it to, you know, if you've got four bike riders that you've got full access to and you can train them for a team to pursuit, that's fine. But when two of them are world tour pros, how hard is it to get them together and to get them to mould them into a team's pursuit? Look, I think what we shouldn't forget is, um, you know, Sam Wellsford has 10 years in the national track program behind him and Cal O'Brien has seven years. Uh, so them going to the world tour makes it tougher. Um, given that Sam, uh, is with Bora, you know, you, you're trying to build that relationship and, um, and get them to believe in what you need to do for him to perform at his best. Um, and Kel being at a uh, green edge, obviously, uh, that's, that's, uh, easier. And, uh, we have a good relationship with green edge and whitey. And, uh, you know, they, they were all in um, to, to try and help achieve this goal for Kel. Um, so designing Kel's race program with Green Edge or uh, that they set the race program 
we look at when we need the training camps, um, you know, and then and then allowing him to get that time off to be able to do that training is important. Um, it, it's a lot more challenging, yes, because there's so many more uncontrollables. Um, so i.e. races, race accidents, uh, your health, um, all those sorts of things. And ever changing programs, you know, we know in the in the road scene, um, you know, accidents, health, that that has an impact on riders going in and out of races. So uh, having having those teams on uh, on side was pretty important, and getting them to understand the the need of what we needed to to do to bring these guys together was important as well. Um, but it it does have a lot more challenges. Um, and they're just they're just they're one side of it i guess yeah and i know that uh, jerry was very excited uh that uh that you guys won the gold medal of course and, but uh, cal being uh you could say green heads but jaco alula uh, uh rider uh but, yeah he was as proud as punch yeah 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 no now take us through the final um how nervous were you for the start? How were the boys uh, on the start line? Because it ended up being a nail biter. Yeah, it did. And um, it, look, the 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 whole lead in is um, is something. I mean, it, it's the Olympics for a reason. And uh, you know, you got to be able to handle that pressure and stay calm and. Um, you know, really, really believe in what you're doing and your process as you're leading into the games. And we, we'd done a bit of a hit out about 10 days before um, in a standing 4K. And we, we knew that we were moving uh, reasonably well. And we still had to, we, we still had to freshen up. So um, I knew that there was, there was uh, the potential of a couple of seconds coming off the time that we did. Um so we had the we had the qualifying. We actually did a flying 4k hit out uh, three days before the qualifying, um, and that was we went three seconds faster than we've ever gone before, and so that that gave us good belief that uh, we were heading in the right direction. Um, but then once we did qualifying and uh, we we went off third last, um, you know we set the fastest time. And then the the two teams that went after us uh, went out chasing it and couldn't match it. You know they they fell fell away in the last kilometres. Um, that that then built our confidence. So we had good belief. You know once we'd done the the qualifying, that then built our confidence that we're in a good place. And we'd done a lot of preparation uh, mentally on our mindset to be good for the three days because. You know, you have to win the Olympic Games on that third day, and it's actually quite, um, quite uh, tense doing one TP per day over three days. You know, you, you've got a uh, 23 hours and um, 56 minutes and 20 seconds of the rest of the day to think about what the next race is going to be like, you know? So, yeah. so, so it can be quite tense, you know, but as I said, once we qualified, well, that gave us confidence. Um, then, you know, we were racing the defending Olympic champions. We didn't want to give them an inch. Um, you know, we didn't want Ghana to be, to be in the race with, you know, within four laps to go. So it was about building, building our lead before he took over and, um, you know, we, we rode really well in that. Um, and that's when we broke the world record because we, we started to get them inside a little bit. Um, but then, you know, coming into the final, you break a world record, you're 1.3 seconds faster than everybody else. You know, having the, the weight of your nation on the athlete's shoulders is, uh, it can be quite stressful. And it's something that, um, we tried to push aside and, um, you know, I tried to take a, a lot of weight of that um, so that they could focus on executing their race um, well and, and winning that gold medal because, you know, world records, they'll, they'll always be broken at some stage, but um, 
those Olympic gold medals that they those four boys have got that they can never be taken away. So, you know, coming into day three, it was really about uh, nailing our process again. Um, you know, understanding what the Brits' strengths and weaknesses were, and making sure we knew where we were and where we were strong, and how we could hold them. And um, you know, there's there's a couple of little things that 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 I have in my, um, you know, up my coaching sleeve to to give them the belief that uh, they can, they could achieve it, um, and and we knew we were in, it was going to be hard pressed for them to to beat us. Um, not being overconfident, but um, you know we'd we'd had a good two days, and there was no reason why we couldn't back up on that third day and. It showed that we did back up well. You know, our team rode together and rode very um, smooth and flawlessly, didn't fall apart. And um, because we'd noticed over the last couple of days that GB had been, you know, breaking apart in the last lap and a half or so. So <laughs> I <certainly> if that did, <laughs> yeah, and if that if they were going to come at us, if they were going to come at us and try and match us on that day three, then you know they needed. We were, we were at war. That they needed to be prepared to go super, super deep, and and in the end, um, you know, it was we were point two ahead. But you know, we'd been point two ahead for quite some time, and uh, you know, it was it was gonna it was more than likely gonna stay that way. And then um, in the end, they they started to fall apart again in the last lap. Well, Ethan Hayter just seemed like he did a great ride up until that moment. He, he he reduced the gap a fraction in that last lap and a bit. I think he went a lap too far myself, but as it turns out, he probably did. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he didn't he didn't just slip off the seat. He he, he actually collapsed because he just pushed himself so far. Doesn't slip yeah. off the seat. He probably yeah. just dropped anyway. You know what I mean? He, yeah. he didn't slip off the seat. Yeah, I mean, these guys are are going so deep into their reserves and, you know, they're doing it three days in a row and, and you might think, oh, it's only three minutes 40, but, you know, it's it's everything they're getting out of their body at high powers and uh, high cadences. And, um, you know, Ethan had been doing a very similar role to what Sam had been doing, yeah. which is taking that load of those last, you know, three and a half to four laps or four and a half laps. And, um, yeah, he in in the end he um I mean Cal O'Brien spoke to him and um he just said to Cal I, I just I had nothing and I collapsed in in the upper body basically and then yeah. you know which which caused him to slip forward of the seat and uh, not be able to sustain it so yeah, yeah. it was amazing, yeah, well, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> overall a, a wonderful performance uh, from the uh, cycling team all round with Grace. Starting it all with that amazing uh, win in the yeah, it was Dantra phenomenal, Hull. wasn't it? It yeah. was just sensational. She just killed yeah. it. Uh, and then, of course, the boys, um, Matty Richardson and uh, Matty Glatzer. Um, I thought it was a lovely finale for them to get uh, silver and bronze in the uh, in the Kieran at the end. It would have been nice with gold and silver, but uh, that <laughs> big Dutch was pretty hard to beat. But it was a wonder, wonderful effort and great for, for – Matty Glazer to to uh, for his finale to an amazing Olympic campaign. Yeah, yeah, so good to see him um, persist and uh, get some reward and get an Olympic medal. Well, he ended up with two Olympic two medals. Of, they got yeah. they got bronze in the team sprint and then he got yeah. bronze in the Karen. So amazing that he's uh, you know been at it for uh, this was his four, fourth Olympics and uh, he got some just rewards for um, all his hard work. Well, it's a beautiful story in that he's come back from, you know, from, from cancer uh, and that would finish most uh, sportsmen. But, you know, top end sprinting, which is a you know, power gain like that, to come back, is, it's very impressive. But yeah. uh, you yourself, Timmy, you weren't too well not, not that long ago. You, you managed to <laughs> make a bit of a mess yourself. You seem to be back in uh, top form, mate. Yeah. Look, I've had, I have had a couple of accidents over my uh, lifespan, and the the last it was 2019, the last one um, where I had to have some brain surgery 
from a, an accident out in, the, out in a group ride. And um, look, uh, the reality is, you know, when you when you do a head injury or you, you have brain surgery, that there's a couple of years there until you start to feel back to your, uh, you know, your normal hundred percent self. And, um, I think I was, I was very close to that, um, at the Tokyo games. And, you know, it was probably a blessing in disguise that, that Tokyo, Tokyo got, uh, delayed a year. Um, and then honestly, uh, having, having a year's break after the, after the games and, and trying something different, it, it was it was needed and it actually gave me uh time to prepare for the you know the next two years of coming back into um cycling australia and and preparing for the olympics um i'm not saying that was uh pre-planned but um it was uh you know that's that's how the stars align sometimes don't they and um you know the job that I originally held was up for uh, grabs again and advertised and I um, I knew that I had to apply for it and um, see if I could win my job back or win my <laughs> old win my old job back and um, you know get back in with the guys for for the last two years leading into Paris Jimmy, great to have you as always and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, catching up very soon. Uh, one last question. What gear did they ride? Oh, well, <laughs> if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. No, <laughs> jokes. <laughs> no, look, they, they, they all uh, – so um, Connor and Sam rode the same gear. Um and then Ollie rode a smaller gear and Kel was a little bit in between both of them. So, so they all had their own individual gears on. So you're telling me nothing. But it's around uh, 120. <laughs> is, that, is that true? They're riding around 120 inch gear? No, nah, it's bigger than that. It's bigger. Than bigger? That. Yeah, yeah. jeez. Oh, the, the variation was from 123 and a half to 126. Bloody hell. That is just yeah. amazing. <laughs> All right, yeah. mate. Well, look, yeah. th thanks again. Thanks heaps. Um, congratulations. It's just you, 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 we all are in, uh, are you a, a, a big debt of, uh, in gratitude, mate, because seriously, what you did was just staggering. And, uh, um, yeah, really proud of you, mate. Yeah, thanks. Look, it, it isn't. It hasn't happened overnight and um, it hasn't happened without good people around me um, and that's that's certainly important to it. So there's been some good people around me, including my wife, who's uh, put up with me through all this this time. So, yeah. <laughs> She's a legend. I love the, uh, <laughs> the footage uh, on Facebook of uh, uh, meeting you at the airport. It was great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was nice to get home. <laughs> all right, bud. Look out. Right, yeah. Thanks. Thanks See for having Jimmy. me. Bye. See ya. Bye. Now, another regular on the show, Johnny, is, of course, Luke Plapp, diehard Carlton supporter. Uh, I'd like giving him a bit of a ribbing before you did the interview with him, given that the Hawks pumped them last week. But uh, yeah. tragic. Football. Yeah. Tragic <laughs> circumstances for his time trial ride at the Olympics. Uh, you obviously talked to him about the injury, but um, he was on a good ride, too, up until when he crashed. Uh, he would go for a medal. Uh, he's known for how well he finishes. He was only four seconds down on the Venipol. I mean, that's seriously, seriously big stuff. He was he was up. So it's a shame that he's also not going to now be able to ride the world title. So, yeah, yeah double whammy. All right. Well, here's the interview Johnny had with Luke Plapp uh, earlier today. Okay. Luke Plapp. Our, uh Australian road champion and uh, three three in a row. Um, I'd just like to uh, firstly congratulate you on uh, an absolutely brilliant preparation for the Olympics and you were on a ride. And, of course, we know now that uh, it all come unstuck. Just uh, take us through it, mate. Yeah, it was a pretty amazing four months, to be honest, building up to the Games to be able to go home uh, to Australia after the Giro and just have a specific prep for that. Everything was 
perfect and mentally it was uh the best thing possible um and got on the start line of the games and was in pretty yeah great headspace and i knew the legs were there um and we got halfway through the halfway through the race almost the first time check was looking really good and in and around the medals and just before i crashed uh yeah we were around that second place mark and it was looking amazing but unfortunately came down on one of the roundabouts put myself into a barrier uh and yeah put my put the barrier through my spleen and my bowel and spent five days in hospital and had surgery um and still actually not back on the bike now i'm currently on my way to nice for a bit of an off-season break on the beach there and catch up with some mates so it's uh yeah it's been a bit hard having so long off the bike and what could have been a, such an amazing race and built towards the end of the year and to worlds is now um put a stop to my season it was uh, i remember talking to you just a few days after the accident you were still in hospital and you said it cut into you like a cookie cutter uh you, the way you described it, it must have been uh pretty horrific yeah i just slid straight into the leg of the barrier um and it went all the way through me took a massive chunk of skin out and yeah damaged the uh the bowel and intestines in the middle as well so there was surgery internally and then obviously they had to stitch up the outside of my body as well um which is a nice little scar it's funny i've got the olympic rings tattoo after tokyo and right underneath them i've got a massive scar of to remember paris so hopefully um we can add a bit of a different memory in la Look, it was just, uh, yeah, you're only four seconds down on the uh, eventual winner of Interpol when you went down, which is just uh, terrible stuff. And so uh, I know the worlds were going to be really important for you, so uh, no worlds. So does that mean that virtually this season you you won't be lining up again or will you just start doing some inter-season races um, to get going again? Yeah, so no worlds. It was an option um, just to do it. Obviously, I was selected, but... I think after the Olympics and knowing the shape I was in, I didn't want to just turn up for experience anymore. And I wanted to go to the worlds and show what could have been at the games and put my best foot forward. So if I can't do that, I won't go. Um, so I've got two weeks off now, which will give me five weeks in total of not riding. And then I'll build up for six weeks uh, before Tour of Guangxi in China. And then after that, just continue training for the summer of cycling, basically. So I have my big break now. Um, do China at the end of the year, which would be a bit of fun and see how I can go there after six weeks of riding and then keep building towards the summer of cycling, which we all know how much I love and can get motivated for. That Look, and you get to try, try and win four, four Australian road tiles and break the record in a row. Is that is that the plan? Yeah, I'm not sure if the course is in my favour this time. <laughs> so try and go back to back in the TT, obviously Tour of Brights first, and then after Tour of Bright, we can look at that fourth road yeah. title. Now, it must have been uh, an amazing uh, – um, oh, look, you were in hospital for most of it, but but just to be there, uh, I know we saw Grace the next day after her gold medal performance in the hospital visiting you, and, of course, the trackies had to wait a little bit longer. But to be a p- part of that where you were in the, the track squad uh, with the bronze medal from the, from the games before, it must have been frustrating to be laying in bed watching it, but you must have got a lot of pride from it. Oh, for sure. It was uh, pretty exciting being in bed and watching those boys go to work. Um, that was pretty remarkable. And they've been going at it for so long now, especially Sammy being his third cycle. Um, he definitely deserves that and it's pretty awesome for them. And yeah, with Grace, mate, like I stopped my warm up halfway through basically to watch her cross the line and do her thing. It was it was really, really special to be able to do that whole build up um, in Paris before the race and the recons and the warm ups. Um, and you could tell she was on and she was confident. Uh, so to see what she did, that gave me so much more morale and belief for myself as well. Um, like I got off and I was hugging everyone and it was just great to see what she did. So that definitely helped me before my race. And I think in terms of the cycling team, it was a pretty awesome effort. Uh, unfortunately, the boys or oh, and the girls couldn't get it, couldn't get it done in the road race. Um, but no, it was definitely awesome to be able to watch that from the, uh, from the hospital bed. Now we were just talking to Timmy Decker, and uh, he, he he loves you. But he had a bit he got a bit of a dig at you. He said he was listening to a podcast. You were talking to someone, and you said uh, they'd be lucky to get a medal. And he said, "Right, 
you 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 tell Luke uh, we did get a gold medal, mate. So he's having a go at you. <laughs> no, good, mate. I very very happy to be proven wrong. Those boys, uh, that was remarkable. That was uh, super super exciting, and I think basically put three perfect TTs uh, teams pursuits together. That was unbelievable to see what they were capable of, and. Timmy's been hunting that medal for a long time, um, which is super special to see him get what he deserves. Um, and I think especially what Timmy and Sam have gone through the last three cycles now, it's, uh, I think they got what they both knew they were capable of and it's awesome to see. Yeah. Well, thanks heaps, mate. And um, we will look forward to seeing you when you get back to Oz in, uh, I guess it'll be November when you get back. Yeah, um, end of October. End of October. So we're having a Mario special uh, get-together Christmas party uh, at the end of November, so I'll let you know. And, uh, yeah, and, um, we'll, we'll catch up and have a couple of quiet ones. Beautiful. Sounds good, John. Cheers, mate. All right. Thanks, buddy. Now, we talked iffy with Tim Decker earlier, and you didn't mention the Factor Bikes. Uh, obviously, that was a huge part of their success. And uh, if you go to their website, uh, factorbikes.com you can see all the latest gear but the one that is prominent on the website is the Hanzo track bike if he as they say the gold standard um, and it was clearly fast it was fast all right we saw I saw it it was launched uh, at the Tour Down Under uh, back in January and it did look fantastic there it is there uh, and um yeah, I spoke to the boys and they said it was super fast. And and, and uh, the Israel Primitic uh, guys ride them on the road. Um, and I know that uh, Clarky loves his, his factor bike. And I've got one. Hang on, I'll lean over one sec. I'll grab it for you. So this, so this is great content for you guys yeah. that are listening oh, to the podcast. Yeah. John is holding up his factor bike right now. It's actually pretty clean, which is surprising. Yeah, you can't hear me. That, that one, mine's called the Vista, and it's yep. one of the best bikes I've ever ridden. It's a, it's probably the the, the roadies gravel bike. It's got uh, very comfortable to ride. Uh, I've got the road tires on, but you can put really big gravel tires on as well. But it's a seriously, seriously good bike. Well, speaking of this. You're talking about Simon Clark, uh, the Austro Vam 2024 Tour de France edition. You can get on the website as well and uh, check that out. It's pretty sick looking paint job too, eh? It looks fantastic. Mine's, mine's army green, so uh, it doesn't look as good as that one. But gee, forgetting about the colour, it, uh, it's the ride that, that, that counts. Uh, and they've they've done really well in just a short time. In fact, bikes. So it's a, it's a and do you know they they came on board and built that track bike up? They weren't building track bikes, and now they've built probably the fastest track bike in the world. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, it's uh, been unbelievable success for them in, a, as you said, a short period of time. So go to factorbikes.com and check out all their latest gear. Uh, and then, yeah, you'll be well on your way to if you want to aspire to Olympic gold medal, hit the track, get on the bike, away you go. Um, now, <laughs> Johnny, wrap things up. We're talking at the top of the show, Tour de France Femmes, that's just wrapped up. And uh, you chat to an Aussie legend of the sport, Liz Heppel. Well, due to our fans, uh, we've got a special guest, uh, one of the legends of Australian cycling, uh, Liz Heppel. Now, Liz, for those who don't know, uh, was the first Australian to get on the podium in the Tour de France. Back in 1988, she got third in the, uh, in the in the Women's Tour de France, which was, I think we'll get the update in a minute, I think it was a full two and a bit weeks back in those days, running in conjunction with the men's, uh, and also finished second in the Giro that same year and rode in the Olympics in 1988 as well. So, Liz, welcome to the Detour. Thanks, John. Great to be here. <laughs> Well, only uh, we've just finished the most amazing uh, Tour de France uh, Femme, uh, Avec Swift. Uh, I've got to say, last, we were able to watch both the, the men's stage of the Vuelta and the final stage of the women's Tour de France. And I, could, I was and on both SBS channels, I was flicking between the two. And pretty soon I just forgot about the men's uh, Vuelta <laughs> because of the... The Tour de France was just so riveting. One of the most amazing stages I've ever seen. So 
just give us your reflections on that wonderful night. It it was yeah. I, I think the format these days is you know it, it really um, works for the the women's tour at the moment, um, and to have it finish on the Alp d'Huez was like sensational, and I think it was. You know, it was always going to be fairly close, especially after um, Demi Vollering lost time when she crashed the other day. Um, and I didn't, yeah, I was a bit surprised that she was able to get away on the Col de Glanon, which was the one before the final Alpe d'Huez. Um, but she did, and she was looking really strong. And it really, at that stage, it looked like um, that um, Katja Niodonna wasn't going to be able to uh keep her within the minute and 15 seconds or whatever. Did it look minute. that way? <laughs> no, no, I think we'll, we'll just dissect that. We'll dissect the yeah. tour in a minute. But I just wanted to yeah. just, just quickly reflect on uh, when, when you rode the tour back in 88, mm -hmm. it was in conjunction with the men. So you finished the same finish lines only, you know, just before. Um, mm -hmm. That must have been a pretty special uh, um, moment. Yeah, it was absolutely incredible. Um, like we got the opportunity to race before the men, so we would start further up the course than the men. So our start line might have been half the distance of the stage for the day. We would start before the men, but all the spectators were in place. Uh, there was like we had the pretty much very similar support to what the men had. We crossed the same finish line and then as soon as we crossed, we quickly had a shower and we hopped in our cars and we drove to the next town. So we rode, um, the first year I did it, we, it was um, almost three weeks that we raced for, which was a very long time because we were <laughs> not used to racing that sort of distance. But it was like we were pinching ourselves at how lucky we were. It was just um, so exciting and such a privilege to be able to do that. So we didn't have pro teams as they do now. It was national teams. So you're an Australian national team, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's right. Um, that was the way. There was one or two um, women's professional teams, but not many. So all the big, well, you know, the bigger tours, there weren't too many tours around at that time, but they were all based on national teams for the women. Um, there was very little prize money. I think the, um, the prize money that we got for coming – for me, coming third in the women's tour in 1988 was about um, $500 to split them up. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was sort of like, it was like, well, yeah, it's nice. Let's just that'll count us beers each for the night or something in Paris. But they so. flew you over first class, though, from Australia, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, we paid our own way. For the, the first year, we paid everything. The second year, we got a bit more funding. And by the third year, we got... Um, we got better funding and we also got the support of having a director sportive who at the time was Shane Bannon um, and we, uh, yeah, we we didn't have to pay for it. Our first year we even had to pay for the mechanics. So it was, <laughs> it was very budget but once again I don't regret or, um, yeah, I wouldn't have changed the thing because, you know, it was just such a great opportunity to be part of that and be part of the excitement and the history of it. Now, one of the most impressive things of the tour as it's grown over the last couple of years because, you know, a bit of pressure came uh, on the organisation to put a women's race, so it was just a two-day and then a one-day, and now the last couple of years it's been a, a full-on tour and it's growing. Mm. But the fact that it's on its own and it's getting huge crowds. Now, let's get into this year's event. I mean, mm -hmm. the crowds at the start in Rotterdam were just, I'm absolutely mind-boggling. Mm, yeah, they're just um, they're unbelievable. Well, not unbelievable. The um, the Dutch are certainly the strongest women in the world and they obviously um, they get the support of their, their country, which is probably one of the big reasons why they are so good because it's obviously a, um, a prestigious sport in, in Holland and the, the riders, are, the female riders are well recognised and I'm sure that has a lot to do with them getting so much support. Um, other countries in the world aren't quite as, um, they don't have as many like top female women, but uh, it's coming. I'm, I'm really optimistic that, you know, soon it's going to be a truly international sport and there'll be like really good competitors from every country. Now, it we talked about it. So it started in, in Rotterdam and, and, and Charlotte Cool won the first couple of stages. Demi Vollering 
won the time trial quite well, although bad luck for Grace, that was her big chance to do something, and she punctured yeah, in, yeah. in the, in, in, in the end of the time trial. It's by Grace and Hay puncturing. It, it, it is. Yeah. But stage five was the was the, the surprise stage. Uh, Blanca Vass mm. won it, who's a teammate of Demi. Mm. Uh, but when Vollering crashed, like just seven or eight K out, mm. no one from her team stopped, which I still can't get over, because in the end it's what cost her the bike race. It she chased her own and lost that minute and a half. I can't it work it out. Standard. Um, what I heard was they interviewed the the winner, and uh, also uh, sorry, I've just I forget who else was left in there. Um, but they said the radios weren't working, and I kind of went, yeah, <laughs> you know, okay. they say that, but I'll give them the um, the benefit of the doubt, and I and I I guess I believe that they weren't working for them, um, and that could have created a big problem. I, I've never heard of radios not working in a, a bit major tour, so I think that's sort of like that was an absolute oversight if they hadn't have been working but they hadn't checked those that to make sure that they would have communication because I think every other rider in Demi Vollering's team um, were either in the crash with her or were behind. So that was the reason that there was only one woman that was able to help her. Um, so, yeah, it was very, it was kind of like, you know, what's going on here? And her teammate um, has won the stage and didn't wait for her. Now, why not? And, but, yeah, the explanation was that the radios weren't working. I, you know, like, uh, same thing happened to Goodell in the World Championships that he won. Yep. I think he turned yep. it off, actually, but he said it didn't work. But anyway, yeah. it's another story. But yeah. as it turned out, look, we, we, we can talk about every stage, but, that finale, it was just so special. I think we should just concentrate mm. on that. I mean, yeah. it's the fact that um, uh, Kath, New, New Adonna didn't – she actually got – she just blew up going over that second last mm. climb. She, she's just dropped. And I thought it was over, game over. But she mm. just recovered on the descent mm. and uh, and kept it at that minute the whole way up, up to where's. It was just an impressive ride. So as much as I felt mm. for – Demi to lose it by four seconds. Yeah. It was a super, super ride by, by uh, Cassia to, to be able to stay so close. Yeah. I, um, my understanding after listening to the interviews is that she basically blew, not blew up, but she bonked. She hadn't had enough to drink, enough to eat um, before the gland on. So she she said that um, at the, over the top and on the descent, she just was just put ate as much food as she possibly could, um, drank lots of biddens, and then she felt good or felt better on the outdoors. I don't see it having a great day, but I think you could absolutely put it down to her not drinking and eating enough, um, probably prior to the glandon because it's not an immediate. It's just that it catches up with you when you when you bonk. And, yeah, if by the time, you know, you get food in you, it takes a little while to recover from that. So um, <laughs> you still looked... They all looked like they were really pushing it and they were at oh, their limit. Were, it was them. just, yeah, yep. man on man or woman on woman, as I say. It was just amazing. Yeah. I reckon yeah. she would have been a bit upset with uh, uh, Muzak, Avita Muzak, who yeah. rolled yeah. it for yeah. third. Yeah. If she had <laughs> lost it by one second. Oh, hey? Yeah, but then that's, that's the way the tour goes, right? And, um, you know, yeah. That's it's all's fair in love and war and bike racing and yeah, but <laughs> it's, you know, generally speaking, there's a really good vibe around the women's tour. Like they all, they all commiserate with someone who has a bad day. Everyone feels it because they know what it feels like to to crash and or to have a setback like a puncture or something. So I just think the um, like I, I guess compared to the vibe, I'll call it around bike racing. 25 years ago or so, 30 years ago when I was racing, um, it was a lot more competitive and there wasn't the same sort of support for other riders. And there was, there's, but now there's a lot more appreciation and, and congratulations for the top riders as well as, you know, that understanding that, hey, you know, sometimes things don't go your way. So I just, yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, I was impressed with in the last couple of days with uh, Sarah Gaganti, who is getting mm. stronger and stronger. But it's frustrating to watch her descending uh, or mm. sitting in the bunch. She's just not mm. good at it. She took so strong uh, uh, over the Glendon and then lost about a minute and a half going down the other side. Mm. And she did it the same uh, earlier in, in the race. Yeah. She kept getting lost uh, out the back mm. and back on. And 
it, it's something she, we, she's really got to look into. She's got the potential to be, you know, one of the best in the world. Yeah. And she's one of the best climbers, but she's got a long way to go. But I uh, think it's on, one. Mm, sorry, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm sure she's the one that's most frustrated by it. Um, yeah. I think she's well aware that that's um, that's what's stopping her becoming. Um, you know, being on the, the the podium in the Tour de France. Yeah. Um, I think also combined with that, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of, um, I guess, scrutiny of what she's doing. And so that probably doesn't really help. Um, but I, I personally, I know that when I, I did my first women's tour, I was, I was a Sarah, I was like off the back and I, on the descents, I was up there in the climbs and then the descent had come and I'd be, I'd lose 50 places. <laughs> and then I just went away and got absolutely determined to learn to descend properly. And um, yeah, I just, I thought, well, I'm wasting my time if I don't really work on my descending and I don't get more confident doing it. And so the next year I came back and I could descend. It's just, yeah, it's, it can be just this. <laughs> mindset switch exactly. where the, the switch just flicks and you can do it um but yeah it doesn't take much to sort of like lose it then if you have a crash or something so uh just talking about the aussies um the the um the live live jaco uh Alula team uh really struggled with that with, with crashes uh we lost Ru ruby roseman gannon altogether the, the, mm. the spanish leader uh crashed badly as well but mm. uh it was impressive to watch young Neve, Neve Bradbury. Um, I, mm. I know her dad really well, and she's yeah. really, really become a bit of a star. She was unlucky to crash earlier too, but she mm. she was so strong in in uh, yeah. her domestic role. Oh yeah, she's fantastic, and uh, you know it's a little bit frustrating sometimes being in riding to support their best rider um, in the in the tour. But on the other hand, she has got a great future, and she won that stage in the Giro d'Italia. So. Um, I yeah, she's only young. We will see a lot more of her, yep. <laughs> which is great to see. It just makes me so excited to see these young women coming through and just living the dream. And you know, it's 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 hard. It's a really really tough sport. Like I don't have to tell you that, but there's going to be ups and downs. But you can see they just absolutely they just revel in it. They're having such a good time, and they're but. You know, they know it's really hard work and it can be sort of like just torture sometimes, but, yeah, it's great to see. <laughs> Look, we're, we're about to wrap it up. I just want a couple of quick uh, questions to leave on. Uh, uh, firstly, you, they didn't come much tougher than you, Liz. I mean, you were also uh, become a top triathlete as well, so you managed to swim, run, do the whole kit and caboodle. But how would you like to be there as a professional in this current climate? Yeah, I, you know, I, I often ask that question because it's sort of like in some, some days, sometimes I regret not having the opportunity to be a professional and to do that sport and, and tour the world and make a living out of it. Um, but I think the pressure of racing these days is a lot greater than the pressure that was on us. So I think it's sort of, it's, it's probably, you know, I mean, it was fantastic for us to be there, but on the end, but, and we didn't get the same accolades or the same audiences, but there wasn't that sort of like the pressure and the stress and the sort of the scrutiny of everything you do and the sort of like, you know, the, the I guess the haters out there that on social media who are always um, sort of like, you know, don't do anything, but they love to sort of like criticise people online. Um, so I think, yes, I would have loved to have, but I, I certainly... Um, know that there is these days there's a lot more stress so I think that's sort of that's the downside but the upside is that they're getting a lot more um attention and and love and um yeah I guess you know there's more and more women racing really well so it's great and Liz uh last one what would what advice would you give to uh, any young youngsters just coming into the sport I'll oh, follow your dream <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, you know, it's just know that the there will be really tough times with bike racing. There will be times when you crash. There will be times when you get sick. There'll be times when you have poor form. There'll be times when things go wrong. But you have to keep your eye on where you want to go and, um, and, and, and focus on the good times. Focus on the things that you do well, the great things about it, and just, you know, keep – keep trying sort of like if you get knocked over get back up again and do it again if you love it 
um, yeah, just try and reach your potential. Liz, thanks heaps. And uh, uh, you always were a star back in the in the oh. 80s and, and you still are. So uh, no, thanks thank so you. much for joining us <laughs> on the detour. No worries. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Okay, right, see you. Bye. Bye. Oh, Johnny, that was a big show, mate. A lot of interviews there and, geez, there's no dropouts. Isn't that amazing? I've, and amazing. We fixed the uh, my, my microphone, which turned out to be just a, a <laughs> little button. button I wasn't pushing the right way. But uh, yeah. no, we've all worked out. Headphones in and uh, how can you build. It looked great to be, uh, to be back on with you. Jonesy, as always, um, look forward to uh, our next one. I reckon we'll do one uh, while the world is going because we haven't spoken about the world of it. It's uh, the, the stage. Um, just Caden gone. Groves. Caden Groves, a, a, a very, very good sprint. And that's his first win since the world the last year. So um, he's been disappointed because he, he's a class act, uh, had an injury early in the season and had, it took a while to get going. Ripping bloke too, uniform. ripping bloke. Ripping bloke and ripping form. So uh, I expect at least another couple of stages, another one tonight actually, from Caden. So we'll see. Yeah, well, I'll be tuning in to see how my old mate George Bennett's tracking as well. He's uh, he's looking lean, so he should go well in the second and third week. So we'll tune yeah, in that. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie Dunbar too is another rider. Oh, he might be an Irishman, but he's in the Aussie team. And uh, I know that he's been disappointed with the with, – with the injuries and that that he's had, he's out. Uh, I reckon we could see a top five performance from Eddie Dunbar. All right. Well, stay tuned to all our social media and we'll keep you updated as to when we're doing our next episode. And also, uh, you've had a few people email you, john at cyclingevents.com.au, for Tour de France packages for next year. Uh, the detour, which is going to be the 20th anniversary. Could be the last time. Is it the last trip? Probably. <laughs> Look, th- this year was first, other than COVID, the first one I missed in 25 years. So uh, and I think if I get back there next year, which we're planning, uh, I don't know that I'll ever stop. I think they'll be nailing the, the box of when I'll it, stop because it, I love it'll, it. It'll all depend on your Google reviews. Let's hope that they're all five stars. <laughs> so anyway, as we said, if you're interested in going to the Tour de France next year, there's packages for the first, second and third week. Email john at cyclingevents.com.au. So, well, we've got, we've had a few inquiries too. We've got uh, um, three or four of the books already. So, yep. Yep. Keep coming in. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll speak soon. And uh, thanks to our guests today. Really appreciate their time. So. Absolutely crank that. Fair dinkum. I haven't heard that good a voice out there since Barnsey days, mate. Barnsey. Mate John Farnham. Like a kitty house, mate. We we smashed it, ripped it up. God, that's good.